Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bonnie Kluwater. I'm the director and chief curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art. And I have to say, this has been quite a week. It went by in a flash. And it's so hard to believe that we started the week on Tuesday up at MOCA. Well, first at Griffin Park in North Miami, where we had an unofficial tree lighting ceremony of Mark's electric tree, Mark Canforth's electric tree, which is part of the exhibition, Mark Canforth Rolling Stop. Um, one of the things I like about this exhibition is that um, it's like MOCA and it's like Miami. It's not confined to any one centralized area. It radiates out all over uh, the county and, um, it, and it's there, it's generous, and it's there for everybody to participate in. Um, I'm very happy that Mark Hanforth has been able to give us some time today. This has been a very busy week. It's been a very exciting week for Mark. And um, of course, we, Mocha opened his exhibition, Mark, Mark Hanforth Rolling Stop on Tuesday night, and it's, ro um, it's rolling on until February. So if you haven't had a chance to run up and see it this week, you do have some time. Uh, thank you, Mark, for being here today. Well, you're welcome. It's great to be here. Uh, right. Well, how's it feeling? What a week. It's, yeah, it's been a good week. It's been a long uh, week, but yeah. it's coming to an end. So it's been, yeah, it's been fun. It's been very good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again. And um, you know, the Museum of Contemporary Art opened 15 years ago. We're actually celebrating 10 years of Basel, 15 years of MOCA. And um, Mark was the first Miami artist to get a solo show at the museum in 1996, and when, right after we opened. And to me, um, I, it was so clear what a strong artist he was uh, when I saw his work in the early 90s, first at um, the Jason Rebell Gallery, as Jason had a gallery on Lincoln Road, and um, Mark was actually the last show in that space. Sure. And I really didn't know you much, but you know, that work really stood out for me, and I knew then that you were someone I wanted to show. Why did you first, why did you come from my, let's hear a little bit of background. Where did, were you well, born? Well, I was, I mean, I was born in Hong Kong, and then uh, when I was, lived there till I was about five, and then we moved to, my parents were English, so we moved to England, to London, and grew up in London, basically, um, throughout my childhood, and went to art school in Frankfurt, where I met Dara, my wife, who's over there, um, and, then we went back to London, and we, we finished up, both of us were at the Slade, and we basically finished art school. And uh, you know, when you finish art school, there's really not, you know, there's a strange moment where you don't know what to do. So um, Dara just said, why don't we go to Miami Beach? I was like, yeah, that sounds great. You know? <laughs> so we just got on a plane and came here. We didn't really have a plan. Did, and, um, did you know anybody here? I mean, what was the drawer? Dara knew, Dara knew it from her childhood a bit, but, but we didn't really know anyone. We really just kind of came. I mean, Dara's a filmmaker, so she wanted to come here and, and um, you know, work with motion pictures, and she was studying motion pictures then. Um, and there was a film industry here then. Um, and we just got here, and it was, a, it was a Miami Beach at that time. This is 92. It was very, I don't know, people probably remember, it was pretty trashed out, and um, it was a pretty wild place. Very, very unlike London, very unlike Frankfurt. Um, you know, something, something like a sort of, um, um, like a kind of trashy novel in reality. And you found yourself <laughs> in the middle of it. And there was something really great about that. And uh, I think I really, really enjoyed that, actually. But at the time, you, it, it wasn't because of Miami being an art center, it hadn't happened no, yet? No, no. Because it not being an art center, actually, right. I think it was entirely the inverse. I mean, I remember when we went, when we left the Slade, there was the, the, there was a, a set of scholarships that they gave to graduating students of the Slade to go to, you know, foreign places, and and I won one of those scholarships, um, and then had it taken away because I was going to Miami, and I remember being called in and being told that, you know, that that they weren't intended to go on vacation. They were for really going to do something <laughs> serious. I was like, well, you know. Well, I mean, you are one of the most serious artists I know, although you have a great sense of humor. And um, did you start finding the an art world here when you arrived? Did you find artists, the curators, um, critics? What, you know? We found, it was interesting. When we first arrived, we found 
first of all, a lot of writers who I really liked, um, who were here for various reasons. Alexander Stewart was a very close friend of ours who kind of, he'd sort of run away from England in a way, and he was living here. There was a whole group, Bob Antoni, a whole group of really interesting writers who were around. Um, photographers were around, there's a lot of that going on. Mm. Um, and then Jason came down. Jason Rebell. You know, he had a gallery in Palm Beach, and right. then he would come down to visit. And then after a year How or so... How did you meet? We just met him in his gallery. We walked okay. into his gallery in Palm Beach. Right. And he was I think I met you up in Palm Beach, actually. It might have been, yeah. Because he, you know, he was showing artists that we knew. So you would, and I think he, you know, you'd walk in and say, is this so-and-so? And he'd be like, you know his name? You know, it's like, oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> really surprised. So it was... Uh, and then we, we lived on, I remember we lived on Euclid Avenue. And one day, I walk, walking down the street, I ran into Jeannie and Antoni just on the street. I'd seen her do her performance at Doffe in London. I thought, I said, aren't you Jeannie and Antoni? She's like, yeah, I'm just, you know, my parents live here. And then gradually more and more people would surface. You know, you'd realize there actually were quite a few artists around kind of lying low, doing their thing. And um, it was really, it was, a, it was kind of a great environment, but it wasn't, structured per se. Right. And yeah. I think for all of us that was the appeal. It was still so much, you know, being in formation. Or we weren't even thinking about it being in formation. It was just there. It was just being you existed, you did things your own way, you started and it was you know, you did have funny experiences like walking down the street and you'd see someone that you knew and had no idea that there would be some kind of connection here. Um, yeah, and, the, and there was a funny kind of, there, there was a period too where there was a sort of a kind of glamorous edge to the place where you could, you could, you could be totally broke here and still get lots of free meal, you know, it was, <laughs> it was you, could, you could exist in a really good way because yeah. there just weren't that many people here to invite to parties, so you'd actually get an invite just to kind of <laughs> fill the room sort of thing. Yeah. Well, it is actually, that was another thing, I mean, it's not so much that, you know, you got invited to a party, but that unlike New York or LA or London, um, the art worlds were pretty much defined and, um, and perhaps there was less fluidity in those art worlds. And here in Miami, I mean, well, you know, one of the things that I really like about it is that it is so open. And if someone runs into, they'll say, yeah, hey, come, come and have dinner with us or I want you to meet this person. It was a very open, generous, um, place to be. It still is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it still Which is. Which I think is still one of the unique things about Miami. Now, you, um, did, you worked at the Rebel Space. I worked at, yeah, I, well, basically, I, you know, we were here, Jason came here and opened his gallery. I mean, I was, I mean, I was an illegal alien for a while. I had trouble with my whole, because I didn't really plan to come here, so I, I didn't really have a visa, and I just, you know, there's a certain point where you get kind of stuck trying to do that. Um, you can't really work. It's kind of tricky, but wait, wait, anyway. Wait, you are, you but are. No, no, but now I know that would marry everything. But so Jason, but Jason was good enough to like, you know, I let me work you. with him and stuff, and you know, it was great. It was really fun. So then, I worked with Jason on the gallery, and then, you know, his parents came out and said they're going to open their collection here. They bought this enormous building, and what was then Winwood was really, really bad neighborhood. There, I mean, it's you wouldn't know it now, but it used to be really, really rough. So when they got the building, it was just really spooky at night, but it was this huge building. Um, yeah, and they, they, they brought their whole collection down. It was, I think it was a really, it was a great thing. It was and what did you do there when? And well, I, I initially it was, it was sort of mainly just me there, and, and they were trying to thinking of how they wanted to do it. And, and I, there were certain artists that they, they had that I really, you know, I was really interested in LA artists at that time. I mean, I still am, but I always was when I was younger. And, and you know, I knew that they, had these Paul McCarthy pieces, and and you know, they suggested that Paul, you know, Paul could come down and install a piece. So Paul came down. Um, I always loved Katie Nolan. So I was, you know, as a teenager, she would, she would be on television in England when I was growing up. You know, it's like this is Katie Nolan, and then it turned out they had this amazing Katie Nolan piece from the Whitney, and you know, I said, well, will Katie come down? And she came down. So she she stayed for like two weeks to install this piece, and it was mm -hmm. fantastic. So I was kind of meeting all these artists that I really really admired. Um, and you had access to them in a way you wouldn't have, yeah, perhaps, cause, cause, in London yeah, or, or New York. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was really making stuff on the fly, too. You know, the whole thing was done in a very, um, you know, it wasn't, I mean, it, now it's all very kind of finished and done, but at that stage it was very much being done, you know, in, in, in the simplest possible way. And it was, mm -hmm. it, was, it was great, actually. It was yeah. really. Um, 
in a way, I miss those days, you know, where it was so informal and we, well, we still have it, but it's it's now everybody's watching. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I think there was something really good about. I mean, it was even thinking about when I, you know, when I first came here, all of those hotels that are along here that are so glitzy now are just burnt out shells. I mean, the the Delano and the the San Moritz and all of them were just crack houses, and it was it was amazing actually. I mean, they were like these sort of they were just waiting, you know, yeah. they were like these, these structures waiting for something to happen and there was something wonderful about that. Well actually we, we talked about that a little bit in, um, with your show and, and in the catalog, the, uh, the idea of, you know, there is a kind of romance in these ruins. I mean, yeah. um, we talked about J.G. Ballard as right. a kind of influence. Do you want to just talk about why this is so fascinating to you? I think I know. I've always been obsessed with ruins. I mean, that's a very you know. I, th I think that's English. Some, yeah, probably, and it's something I, I'd always loved. Sewn, and I'd always, you know, we. There's the, the something John about Sloan, the yeah, yeah. Sloan, the architect. Yeah, and, and and so this, you know, he was obviously fascinated by ruins and the idea of, of, of kind of becoming a ruin, and that this almost like this, that you know, there's a there's a point. I mean, we lived in Rome for for a while too, and there's something about when a city. It almost elevates itself to the point of being a ruin. It's mm -hmm. almost it's that's that's when it's really got somewhere when it's in ruins. Mm -hmm. And you sort of felt that Miami Beach in ruins was almost like this. It was at a really high point. You know, it's almost yeah. it had reached a level. And yet, then in the streets, you had this sort of Elmore Leonard kind of activity going on everywhere. It was this really wonderful mix of the all two. All the characters. All of the characters and yeah. all of the stuff going on. Yeah. Well, we had talked about um, your stay in Rome. It was when. Uh, uh, Dara had gotten her. Um, she had the American. She won the Rome Ac Prize. Yeah, Rome Prize for the American Academy. Yeah. But you, you got to go along for the ride, yeah, literally. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah. And um, you know, you 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 write beautifully because our correspondence um, on emails have been terrific, and I've saved them. And your quote, you know, the way you described Rome and what you know as romantic that you look at for Rome. Yeah. And how that influenced you. Yeah, I mean I think it I mean by very de very de you know by very definition Rome is Rome is where the word comes from and I think that there's, there's what what Rome I mean the funny thing about Rome is what it does so well now is something it's done for hundreds and hundreds of years is be this place where you go to to kind of feel yourself lost in a kind of um, decay. I mean it's just beautiful and it's and it's not but it's just been decaying for so long, and layer upon layer. Mm -hmm. But it never goes away. I mean, it's it, and it's and it never will. And you, mm -hmm. you'll never wear out that ruin. And mm -hmm. I think that's what's so wonderful about it. Well, um, yesterday the New York Times reproduced uh, in color a work you made in Rome, Vespa. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's one of my favorite works, and it is one such an too. iconic piece. You want to tell us how that came about? The Vespa. Well, basically, so we got to we got to Rome. We, you know, Dara had won the Rome Prize. We had a little baby, Violet, who's here. She was tiny then. She was two weeks old, I think, or, or maybe three weeks old when we got to Rome. Um, you know, Dara was was very busy <laughs> being the prize minister. She was the the the, the prize recipients are very you know the, the hallowed fellows in the academy. So I was kind of wandering around Rome with the baby, kind of, and I was, you know, what am I? thinking what am I going to do and what I'm going to make here. It's a strange place because the, the academy itself is this huge palazzo. It doesn't feel like you're sort of, it's not your white box to make work in. It's a very loaded atmosphere. But then, I mean, there were just Vespas everywhere in Rome. I mean, after a while of walking around, you realize these things are just everywhere. <laughs> this, these things just are. That This is the piece. This is it, you know. And, uh, and I'd wanted to make a fountain initially, um, but the water component was really complicated. So then I just I needed something that would be fluid and would keep moving, and, and something that I could use as water. Something that would mean that this thing was continually in, in, in process and in flux. I mean, that's the other thing about Rome too: is it's you really feel um, how direct the connection to Arte Povera kind of is. How it's not much of a jump from just walking on the street to being to making an Arte Povera work. I mean, they're really. You know, we, we live very close to Santa Maria and Trastevere, which is where Boetti had made all those great pieces. And you, you know, it's it's it, there's, there's a really simple, beautiful, poetic logic to that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And so I think the candles um, just seemed the the, the the simplest, most straightforward way of getting to this kind of movement. 
And there were also, you know, candles were everywhere. There were candles everywhere, yeah. and people put them everywhere, yeah, the and they were in bottles, and, and they were in churches, and, and they, they were, were in Chianti bottles. Yeah, <laughs> just everywhere, you know. Yeah. And, and so that was kind of something that was completely mm. part of the fabric of the city too. So it was almost like making a sculpture that wasn't, you know, really wasn't a sculpture. You would hardly even know. And, well, it's actually poetry. It's it's a complete visual poetry. It's romantic. It's always in movement. And and of course, the irony is that the wheels aren't real wheels, they're cement, so it's the work's not going anywhere. Yeah, no, they're real. Well, they're actually yeah. cost, they're cost aluminum, incredibly oh, the heavy. Aluminum, yeah. yeah. We rolled it around a bit when we first made it, and it was practically tore the floor yeah. up because it's so heavy, but yeah. it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, it is immobilized. Yeah. And the, um, the wax is how it keeps the work, is what keeps the work in, in Yeah, and the motion. work just keeps going and going. And you keep, I mean, the other thing that I, that I like a lot about those works is the way that, you know, I, I kind of, the way that I sort of walk away, if you like. like. I mean, I don't really put the candles on myself, and I like it that other people do, and they always do it differently. And there's always someone who really takes care with it and really enjoys it, and, and, and the work just becomes different all the time, every time. Well, um, Ideally, it, it would just disappear. You know, that uh, would be the best, you, you the best show. You know, yeah. the whole thing, oh, you know, okay. the whole Vespa gone, uh, is gone. You know, yeah. It's just a blob of wax yeah. oh. in the end. Um, we'll get there. Now, you know, we worked on that show, um, the first show, not from where we're, I'm standing in 1996, where um, you, did, you took the scaffolding from the construction of MOCA right. and made this open-ended kind of structure that you hung things off of. Now, to me, I see the continuity from that, and I feel, you know, I'm in a very privileged position to have known you right from the beginning of your career, and then now to be working with you um, 15 years later, uh, and I can see the continuity. Uh, but f uh, how many of you had seen that show? Well, actually, there's quite a few people here, mm -hmm. and it's also reproduced in the catalog. So if um, if you hadn't, you could certainly look at it in here. Um, can you talk about how your work has either evolved, changed abruptly? I mean, I think in a changed. way, you know, the scaffolding is interesting because it was very. It was. Um, in some ways, it's a very pragmatic decision because, it, you know, at that stage, I didn't. It's, it's funny when you when you're obviously when you're a very young artist, you don't have any money, you don't have any materials, you don't really have any anything, and uh, you had tons and tons of scaffolding because you were building a huge museum. So, by taking all the scaffolding, I really I was really able to make a really huge piece essentially by by taking what was already there, um, and it, it it kind of provided a method, you know. It, it set the tone for what was going to happen, for what was going to go on mm. with those with those pieces. So that the the interventions I was making, albeit some of them quite small and some of them bigger, with scattering things throughout the scaffolding, mm. um, and I think the business of it changing every day and mm. changing through time, um, you know, I, I, in some ways I think that's still kind of going on in the work. The work, even the relationship to architecture, the idea yeah. that it stopped when it reached the ceiling it, and it stopped when it reached the walls yeah. and it had the potential to continue. But it should just continue and that, and, and that's the, and that there isn't really a, hopefully too much of a beginning and an end to the thing and that it would, mm -hmm. it would keep going somehow. And it was also never clear if you were looking at it, if you were in it. Um, there was a lot of ambiguity about the piece. Yeah, or whether you should be like climbing up it or All whether right. you should be moving the bits around. I mean, there was never really a kind of sense of what the what those parameters would be, which is what was so nice about it, I think, too. Mm -hmm. And also there was um, the other thing that stood out uh, for me from that piece was that the use of color in right. there. You were very specific. It wasn't so much a formalist decision, but it was about how in industry certain colors were made to make things more visible. Yeah. And um, you want to just mention a little bit about that kind of issue in your work? Well, I mean, I've always had that sense with, I mean, co I, color is something that, that, that that I'm very conscious of, I suppose, in the work. You know, I paint a lot of the sculptures, um, and and I think I think this, if you like, there's something about the 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 language, like the semiotics of colors, that's really interesting. That really that 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 becomes very much part of the language of the work. That's that's a huge part of the information that's going on, um, and so. You know, like rolling stop is quite. This is this, the colors here are pretty harsh. You know, and it's. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think there are certain. There, there are, you know, and, and then, then in other pieces you'll have these these in very potentially very heavy sculptures that are painted with very light pastel colors. Mm -hmm. kind of in, in some ways, the, the so color works to kind of subvert the material of the piece constantly. But it's also colors that the industry used. For instance, you used um, 
there was an, uh, I guess, a 1950s uh, photo book of magazine. Right. And you l use that particular color blue because that was the blue that um, photographers used to make skin stand right. out more. Or the yellow of the rain slicker. Right. The idea that you could see that yellow in rain or snow or fog. Right. Um, and, you know, the continuity with works that, you know, like slow. Yeah. With, with that um, hot fluorescent orange, which is used by highways again. Well, the it's colors, those sure. colors are, 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 are wonderful because they, that they're, in, in something, something like the fluorescence too in the works, they're, on the one hand, they're this sort of tangible thing that you can touch, and on the other hand, they really float in space beyond that thing. They become something else entirely. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're very um, basic and quotidian, if you like, but they're also kind of sublime, and they have this, this kind of duality that, that, that I'm obviously, I, I, I love, and that's something I'm always trying to kind of get in the work, I think, is to try to find this point where the, where the solid things kind of leave, leave their solid mass and become something else. And that's particularly true of color. Uh, one of the things we talked about uh, was, um, you know, you being English, cho choosing to be in Miami, which in a way for a lot of people, when you're from another country and you come to a new country, you tend to become more of right. English than you oh, probably right, yeah. would if you were stayed in England. Um, and you know, I was struck when we start when you started to describe how you, you thought about some of the works with the, uh, for instance, the large, the enormous wire hanger, being so linear, and, yeah. and having it against the um, the bright lights of eclipse, and you know w you kept talking about the linearity in your work, even though he's a sculptor, um, you don't really think of yourself as a, a sculptor. No, I mean I am a sculptor because I make sculptures, sculpture. but but. But in the sense, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd happily be a painter. I just don't think I'm a very good painter. You know, I'd, I'd love to be a filmmaker, but I'm not sure that I'd make such good films. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sculptor because it's, it's what I can do well. well. You know, but I would, it's not that I don't want to do the other things. I'd be very happy yeah. to. And not that I think there's actually that much, um, that much difference, I suppose, in Is a way. It? I'm just, I'm just, I, I just love the thinginess of things. Nice. But, uh, but also, as we were talking, and this, the emphasis you kept putting online, it brought to mind a, and a very important, very influential um, artist text called by Nicholas um, Pepsner, The Englishness of English Art, in which he um, it's, uh, it was taught in, in most of the art schools, and you knew his book yeah. on, uh, on architecture, which picks up the same idea, that the English as a whole, as a nation, weren't really a sculptural nation, that um, there was a preference for line. And as we started talking more and more, it was, it was almost as if you were a textbook case <laughs> for this text. Um, they, for instance, there was a chapter uh, called the um, Blake's Flaming Line about the uh, William Blake's illustrations and that how that con was a continuity right from uh, medieval illumination. And um, of course, the eclipse is a major reference to. It's a yeah, Blake. it's a strong reference to Blake, I think, to the eclipse. Yeah. I mean, I've always, I've always, I've always thought Blake was this incredible artist. He was like the, you know, you can you can look at William Blake's and you'd think they're a Raymond Pettibone, some of them, because they're just these crazy images with text pouring out of people's heads, and I mean, they're wild. But but um, he was just a really iconoclastic person of his time, mm -hmm. which. And his time was an amazing time too, when there were lots of people who were actually quite, mm -hmm. quite out there in terms of their thinking and their doing. And I mean, I think they really believed in quite a different world. I mean, I believe in quite a different world. So <laughs> I think I think that this this part of that too. I think there was a sort of there's a there was a um, there was an intensity to those those artists and those writers of that period. I mean, I love the romantics. You talk about you know, romantic poets really wanted. They wanted something else. They, they, thought, they thought that out of this world, you could actually transcend. You could pass to somewhere else. Yeah. I believe that. So. And, I, and I think that that's one of the things that comes off really clear in this show. Um, when you walk in, when I've been touring people all week through the exhibition, and the first thing I say is, I'm not going to talk. I want you to walk in and just experience it. And basically, walk in, and you see 100 feet of uh, this eclipse made out of fluorescent lights, and people really do just stop in their track. And it's doing what you would hope it would do. And then the scale of 
of everything is um, you know bigger than life size. Right. And, um, the the wire hanger suspended from the ceiling is how big? Um, I think it's like 20, 27 odd feet. Yeah, 27 feet long, I think. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked me, said to me last night that he was thinking of a plot about um, a, um, art thieves that wanted to steal the, a giant hanger. And he said, how would you steal a giant hanger like that? I said, put a giant dress on it. <laughs> You know? That's a Steve um, Martin movie. You know? um, but the uh, talk about scale in relation to the work. I mean, why would you take, you know, a very common object like a wire hanger and make it blow it up 20 feet? Well, I mean, I think the first thing about the hanger is, in some ways, it's not. It's it's really big, but it's kind of not at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not it's physically that big. It's a all thing. made of air, basically. Yeah. I mean, there's hardly any material even there. So you end up with this, I suppose, this giant sculpture that's really, uh, yeah, in essence, hardly even there at all. Um, it's not even very heavy. You know, it's just, it's, and, and, I, and that, you know, that, that, that's the beauty, I suppose, of the hanger itself, of the original hanger. But it was, it was, it was a way of kind of taking this very, very simple gesture. Um, and, and giving it form and, and, and allowing you to kind of experience it in, in, in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, so that the, 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 you know, the twisted hanger and the closet's an idea and the hanger in the museum is a sculpture and there's some kind of movement from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I, I think also it was about, you know, I was very conscious with, with, with the show at MoCA about trying to kind of really engage that space and, and try to use the pieces to kind of really work off each other, kind of draw you through the space and, and, and um, kind of map out what the parameters were of the space. I mean, it has this amazing vaulted roof that, that, that you often don't even see because it's above the light grid and it's in darkness. And I kind of really wanted this thing to be quite prominent, I think, in the thing. And the hangar was a great way of getting up there. You know, it's very simple just to hang the thing off the beam and then suddenly you're, you're already up in the roof. It was a way of kind of connecting the floor to the roof. The eclipse stretches the walls. Yeah, that's one of the things I really liked, and one of the things we talked about right when we started working on this was using the museum's architecture as you know in dialogue because it is so unique. And I think one of the people generally haven't noticed our wonderful roof, but because of the fluorescent light, fluorescent has a way of lighting yeah. up that barrel vault in a way that you might not even notice, or even all the grid structure, um, how industrial. It yeah. looks, but elegant at the same time. Um, and I, I have to say, I saw the um, the giant wishbone uh, at your gallery in New York, and yet here, because it echoes the barrel vault shape, you really get the sense of architecture. Yeah, I think piece. it feels really, it feels really great here in the museum. And there's something also about having it. Um, with the eclipse, where I mean, what's great about the eclipse is that essentially everything in front of it becomes a silhouette because you can't really see them. And so, um, you know, both the hanger and the, the wishbone take on these very simple kind of silhouette forms. They're almost like a kabuki play or something that's going on, you know. And I, I, I kind of wanted the show to have that, that, those two very different senses to it. And the other thing, what I saw at the opening, uh, we've got great pe uh, pictures of people just congregating underneath it. Um, and in many ways, that's part of your work, is this idea of being a kind of gravitational pull. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the wishbone essentially, as a piece, comes from a, a commission I did a few years ago in, in the south of France for a, 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 com a big high school and college complex they were building in Grenoble. And, and there was a French government commission to make a piece for this new complex. It was, it's a very kind of, um, it's very French, so the buildings are very harsh and very clean. And, um, it was going to be full of all these teenagers, tons and tons of teenagers. And so, uh, you know, I, I like the idea of kind of making a piece for, t I mean, I, teenagers are great and crazy. So it was, was kind of making a piece that teenagers would kind of engage with and, and um, not hate. You know, and so it, the wishbone really s became the kind of perfect piece. It was, this, it was this sculpture that they could come to and they could hang out on. They could, like, they hide behind the paddle and smoke. You know, they do all these kind of things that kids do, and it's kind of great. So. Um, and the one in France was that they also graffiti and they paint all the time because one of the things about that one was that they would be allowed to, they're not allowed to graffiti anywhere there and they're allowed to graffiti the sculpture. That was, so they, they actually repainted all the time and do all this crazy stuff mm -hmm. to it. But, you know, that, that, and the tree too, that these, these things, all the benches, they're all supposed to be, the, you know, the, the intention is that people would 
be pulled to them, that they would, that they would become social spaces, that that's how they would function. No, let's talk a little bit them, about the electric tree. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, electric tree is one of the pieces that is outside the museum. It's in a park a few blocks from uh, the museum in North Miami, Griffin Park. And uh, if you go on our website, we have the directions for getting to it. Uh, do go after sunset. I did get a call few calls this week. I'm in the middle of the park and I can't find the tree. <laughs> it's like, we'll go back after sunset. It's an electric tree. <laughs> so I guess we should have put it, that on it, don't only visit after sunset. Um, but it was truly a marvelous work. Why don't you explain um, what the uh, electric tree is? Well, essentially, it's a huge, it's a huge banyan tree um, uh, that has its branches drawn out with fl lines of fluorescent light so that the um, the whole canopy of the tree is underlit, kind of shines. You have a, a pool of light that is in, in, essentially in an inverse of the, you know, banyan trees here in the tropics function as pools of shade during the day where people can congregate. And with this one at night, you have a pool of light where people can congregate. So it becomes a kind of beautiful inverse of its function. And at the same time, the lights become uh, a kind of drawing, a kind of mapping of the tree. Um, and they're again, kind of beautiful and clunky at the same time. They're sort of clunky fluorescents, which are, there's something kind of icky about screwing fluorescence into a beautiful tree, and at the same time, there's something very beautiful about that and respectful of the tree. And so it's, it, 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 and it, I suppose that reflects, what, you know, one of the things I really like ab about this city, particularly about the tropics in general, is this, um, this kind of rather awkward relationship we have with an extraordinary nature where we're sort of, um, the nature is so all-consuming and beautiful. Almost everything we do is kind of ugly in relation to it, but it's kind of okay too. Um, and the tree is a little bit like that, where, where, the, where that, that kind of that disharmony becomes a kind of harmony, becomes a way of living together. So I, you know, that there are there are electrical boxes screwed to the tree, and this big electrical conduit running <laughs> up it, but it's twisting with the tree. And there's, there's something about that kind of um, that dance, if you like, that I think is reflective of the way we live here. And, and also, the, I mean, you touched on the fact that um, the composition's basically predetermined by the, the branches yeah. themselves. Yeah, it, it, the, the tree makes itself. So the sculpture basically makes itself. I mean, the other thing I think is one, it was kind of interesting when the piece opened, because one of the things about the piece really is just also just the doing of the piece, like the fact that the mayor of North Miami was you know, agreeable to this and then really into it and that people, you know, that you would, you would find electricians who would really get into it and really enjoy it. You know, there's, there's something about that whole process of kind of building an artwork together with all these, because it took a lot of people to make. So it's about kind of convincing all these people that this, A, that this is something that you would want to do and B, something that they get very involved in and then... And well, actually, it's um, the Museum of Contemporary Art. For, the, for those of you who don't know, we are a department of the city of North Miami and uh, they had decided that they had wanted to do a art in public places program and they wanted to do it at a very high level so they engaged um, the museum as, as advising what to do. When I knew I was doing the show with Mark and Mark showed me what he had in mind for the tree and it suddenly hit me, I knew exactly the tree for him. I pass it every day on my ride to work, I showed it to and you love that yeah, side. Yeah, a great tree. I Fantastic. showed it right away to um, you know the the, the ma city manager and um, the, um, the head of art and public places for North Miami, and they flipped. They loved it and gave the full endorsement of it. And so the other on Tuesday night when we all got together, it was everybody. It was artists. It was collectors. It was your dealers um, from all over, and it was uh, the the local um, you know mayor and and council. And the people who work and the for people the city. who live all around. All I mean, it's really it. built for that community. It's you know, it's 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 one of the, the 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 really important kind of preconditions was that this tree be accessible all the time. That and it's it, that would sound like a really simple condition that you have a beautiful tree that everyone can get to, but it's surprisingly hard. And in this in Griffin Park, there are you know, there's no railings, there's no fences, there's no opening times, there's no, yeah. you know, and and so. And it's also very dark there as it happens. So when the tree comes on, everyone just comes out, you know, and it becomes, it, 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 it's, it's, it's really intended 
It's like the unbasel up there. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know. or, or no, actually, well, I've I mean been using. Nice way. I'm not actually, I've been using it as the metaphor for Basel, Miami. The idea of this great big umbrella that is a point of convergence of how generous it is and how part of the whole community is. Yeah. So that's that's been the exciting thing. And there's another outdoor piece that I hope you all go visit. It's right near the Pulse Fair at 15th Street and North Miami Avenue. It's the uh, Weeping Moon. With, um, made out of neon with a cascade of tears. It's, it's a fabulous piece. And um, one last thing, Mark, about um, the fact that you, except for the few exhibitions, museum shows, and gallery shows early in your career, you haven't really shown in Miami. No, I haven't. And it's funny, when you, when, when you asked me to do the show, I was a bit hesitant because it's, I've, this has been, um, I mean, I really like, I love working here. This is a great place to work, and it's always been the place where I've made things. And so it's kind of strange in a way to, <clears throat> it's always struck me as an odd idea to kind of be showing work in the place where you were making it, because the two seemed, I really wondered how the two would overlap. So yeah, I, I was really, I really paused for quite a while to think about what, you know, and, and how, how I would feel about that, and I suppose. Mm -hmm. but, but in a way, what, what's kind of made all of that work for me has been the making, you know, the weeping moon or the tree, making these pieces that, where, where you're in a sense, you're still using the city as the studio. You're yeah. just making the show part of that yeah. process. You're basically working in the museum and, and in the city, which is, you know, what I do anyway. Well, it's been a wonderful experience, and I know that um, there's people in the audience that have some questions. They've been asking me all week, so let's open it up to the audience. Any, mm. Any questions? Talks. Okay, it's on. Hi, Stephen Kaplan. Um, Mark, uh, from knowing your work over the years, I've always thought there was some influence of you know, various people. Robert Smithson, though, came to mind when you were talking about the duality of nature versus technology. So um, I'm only opening that up in case you want to speak about it. I'm, I'm, yeah, Robert Smithson, I'm, I'm a huge, I'd say I'm a huge fan of Robert Smithson. Um, when I was at art school, um, you know, the, one of my favorite books, I suppose, was the writings of Robert Smithson, and, and one of the particular Smithson pieces I always really liked was the Monuments of the Passaic, because it seemed like such a, it's, it's such a beautiful, simple piece of work, and it was, uh, um, I suppose, with Smithson, that, that notion that the, that the monumental is everywhere, and it's just waiting for you to find it, was, was, you know, really struck me as such an extraordinary kind of way to look at the world. Um, I saw a great, there was a great Smithson show called The Entropic Landscape that was in, I think it was in Brussels when I was a teenager. We went over there and saw it and I was like, this is crazy stuff. Because you didn't really see Smithson that much in, you know, I grew up in, in, in London, in England. It wasn't like there was Smithson show. I mean, he was a pretty specific artist in a way. Um, and, and now you see it all the time, but at that stage it wasn't out there that much. And I think, you know, you, when you, when you saw that work, you're really struck by. It. I mean, I think also that very. Um, I love that kind of intensity where Smithson would look at a natural form and find, you know, that this business. It's like you see with Spiral Jetty, this business of going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in, um, and, and you know that that within every structure around us, we we travel into this crystalline structure that goes smaller and smaller. And I think that sense of of uh, of. Uh, of looking at the world that he lived in very intensely and finding everything in that world. I think. And, and if you, I remember you and Dara coming with um, our second, uh, our other inaugural show was Artist Films and Videos of yeah. the 1970s, and we projected the Smithsons film making the spiral jetty l large outdoors. Yeah, that was fantastic. And I, mean, I, all, and I think you also showed, because there, there was a Smithson project in the Keys that he did. Didn't mm -hmm. you show that as well, where he'd made these pieces with, mm, yeah, with mangroves? Yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah, the film. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, that yeah. Was, I mean, an extraordinary yeah, piece, too. So. And I even think of the golden telephone that's in the show. You wrapped it around your wrapped tree. Wrapped it around a tree, and, yeah. And created a spiral out of that. Yeah, I had a very hard yeah. time getting it off. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Any others? Hmm? Mark, any um, What's your oh. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Uh, I had seen the the electric tree in person for the first time uh, about last week, and I was just considering it in the context that it's in. Like you do a lot of public art as well as uh, work in the gallery setting. Um, 
my question is, uh, do you feel that working in a gallery, I guess you can get away with certain things that you wouldn't be able to in the public realm and vice versa, that, I guess? Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I love doing the public projects, but you can't, you, you can't live off public projects and you can't, and, and public projects are quite difficult to do in some ways because you can't, you know, you, you you're dealing with a very unpredictable audience, which is what's great about it, but you also have to, you know, you need to make things that don't fall down, that don't kill people, that don't, you know, all of these kind of considerations. And you also, I think, have to be very aware of, you know, this rather awkward history of public art that it's often been quite, um, well, either bad for one thing or slightly snobbish and, and, and inconsiderate of the neighborhoods that it's in. Um, and these are all things I think that kind of draw me to public art anyway, because I quite like that kind of dichotomy that you're, you're taking this, you're taking this this artistic conversation that's regarded, I think, by many people as quite elitist, and you're, you're trying to say, well, actually, no, this is a, this is everyone's conversation. This is what culture is, and that that, that the whole point of the word culture is that it means everyone, and if it's not everyone, then it's then it's clearly not culture, and what's the point? And I think you. Um, um, I think you're trying to find a balance between the two. And it, you know, and I, I love doing gallery shows and I love doing public works and they have a different feel and you can do different things. The gallery shows often, the, the beautiful shows, they're very tight and um, generally speaking, the galleries let you do whatever you want <laughs> and they kind of trust you. Um, they're great about that. And um, you know, but I think it's, it's the conversation between the two that really, really makes it for me. Um, but yeah, it's great. A question about public art. I'm from Wisconsin, and and I find that, um, at least in Wisconsin, that the, it, that public art always ends up being highly controversial. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, um, some some of the things that you were alluding to. Yeah. Um, and public art is is so fabulous, but it, as an artist, it it gets fraught with with so many side issues. And often, right. you know, political issues that have, um, in the terms of judging, the, the artwork. Right. How how do you how do you continue to motivate yourself to want to do public art? Or and maybe this community doesn't have those issues. Well, well it I, didn't I, have I, it in North Miami. They yeah. were they were overjoyed with it, and the public responded. I mean, I think it I think it is kind of a minefield in a way. But I also think that's kind of what's fascinating about it. And I think I think one of the the point a little bit too is that that I, I think as an artist you want to kind of or you need to kind of enter that minefield and take it on I and mean, I think that's kind of what's one of the things that I find quite exciting about it is this sense that actually you're uh, you know there's a 95 percent chance that you'll fail and maybe a five percent chance that you'll succeed and you know it's like with the weeping moon that we have downtown you know we, we put this piece up it's a beautiful, I mean, I think it's a beautiful piece, but, you know, as we put it up, it's, you know, the neighborhood there is, is it's, it's Wynwood, it's Overtown, you know. We had a conversation about, well, will we cover up this neon or will we just let it sit on the street? And it's just fragile neon. And they will, let's let it sit on the street. And if people like it, it'll be there tomorrow. And if they don't, they'll smash it. And that's kind of how it's going to go. Um, in a way, that's kind of like saying that art has to live in the world in the same terms as everyone else, that, that, that it's not this, you know, it's not in this protected little white cube, it's actually out there and, and the world will deal with it as it sees fit. And I think that's, that's a way of kind of engaging in, in, in the world's conversation and not hiding from it, I suppose. Let's see what happens actually. Okay. <laughs> so, tear the thing down, so. so Mark, we're, um, our, I believe our time is up, but um. I'd like to hear um, how do you feel after this week? Are you happy to see all these works? I mean, I know an artist, once you make the work and it leaves the studio, you don't really have the opportunity to sit and look at a body. Yeah, yeah, like no, it, it was really, it, it was, I, was, I, was, I was nervous about having the older pieces, and then when I started undoing the crates, I was really, really pleased to see them. A lot of them I haven't seen in years and years. I was really pleased to see them. It was mm -hmm. fantastic, actually. Yeah. yeah, it's been really, really good. And, and it, it is a rolling stop. So the idea is we're just going to slow down and keep on moving. Absolutely. No absolutely. violations there. But absolutely. Well, <laughs> well, yes. we'll keep moving. And I can't wait to see the next phase of your work and your career. And, and again, it was such a pleasure working with you. And um, I'm so proud of you. And um, I know you've been a great role model to the Miami artists. 
you and Dara have stayed here all these years and have had an amazing international career um, and it's still part of our community. It's a great place to work. It's, yeah. And thank you for having faith in me and, and, and letting me do the show and trusting I, I, me. So I'm really having faith in you is easy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Art Basel.